And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, turn your Bibles here to the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. We'll be in there today from verses 10 to 18. And if you see me go like this, that's sweat. So, either way, I'm not complaining about the, the warm weather. I, I love the warm weather, but it's hot. And it's okay to sweat. We're told we're going to sweat. It's what he told Adam. You're going to sweat by the brow. It means you're working. That's okay. So we can all sweat together. So, but today... We're going to be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and I, I titled today, The Eye of the Tiger. I'll, I'll get to that, why I, I titled today, Eye of the Tiger. But first and foremost, as you turn there, get to Ephesians 6, verse 10. As we've been going through the book of Ephesians, Paul has been encouraging us to be living in oneness and working together as members of the body of Christ. We've, you see that. Uh, as we start talking about the practical applications, when we start in chapter 4, as he begins there, you see that constantly. He, he wants us, the body of Christ, to be spirit-led, to be spirit-fed be by his word. We walk by faith and what? Not by sight. And the word of God helps us grow. We allow, so he wants us to allow the word of God to guide us in our walk on this earth. He wants us to give... And God, as we learn through Ephesians as well, he wants us to give him our keys. He wants him to, to give our keys to our house or to our car and let him drive that car for us. Ephesians 3, 17, I just want to put this verse up here. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. The word dwell there means to make yourself at home. And make yourself at home, Lord, in my entire life is what he wants us to say to him. As we read his, it's in, our, in, our, in our, all of our life, not just when we show up to church. But he wants us to say, Lord, make yourself at home at, in my house. At my job, in my marriage, raising my children or helping raising my grandchildren or just being a grandmother or grandfather. Take the keys to our local church, doing God's agenda, not man's agenda. And also allowing the Lord total control of you and your own community. Not everyone here lives in Altoona, do we? We live in different, you know, and even in Altoona is a pretty big area. Different streets and different names. And everybody has neighbors, different neighbors. You know neighbors that I don't know. And God wants you to hand him the keys and, and allow him to use you to be a light to them. And not only that, but he also wants us to be, he wants us to, you know, Give him the keys, let him dwell, make yourself at home in our hobbies. Sporting events, maybe music, maybe collecting stamps, I don't know. Whatever it is, he says, I want to be, in, he wants to be involved with that. But the question arises, why should we give the keys to the Lord? And the answer is this, because we are in a spiritual warfare. Paul tells us about it, so let's read it together here in Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now hold up. We're to do all the above that I just talked about. Giving God, you know, giving him control of our life, right? We're to do all of it. Everything that we've been talking about. We're to be walking in newness of life. 
And then the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, right here and on, 10 and on, he then tells us, by the way, there is a battle. And it's real. What are you going to do? Well, and to put it in, uh, into our language today, we need the eye of the tiger. If you've ever seen the eye of a tiger, it's intimidating. But let me explain what the eye of the tiger is. You need to have the eye of the tiger to get you through life and to get you to where you want to be. It's about turning every opportunity into a reality rather than sitting there and complaining. Knowing that you're part of God's workmanship. Knowing he wants us to walk in newness of life. That you and I, as members of the body of Christ, are ambassadors. That we have the message of reconciliation. We can go anywhere and anytime to preach the gospel, the good news, what Christ did for every single person in this entire earth. It's about putting the side of the tiger. It's about putting all the effort and training into action. The eye of the tiger is knowing your strength and giving your all. It's not about, it's, it's about not going through the motions, but living with purpose and intent and focus and determination. You hear about this eye of the tiger when people in sporting events, that guy had that eye of the tiger, or just the more famous movie, The Rocky, right? And he had that eye of the tiger. How many times the guy was able to get punched in the face and he just kept standing there to get punched in the face. But he just had that eye because he was going to win. He put all the, the, the training and he put it into action. Well, what we've been having here in Ephesians chapter 1 and on and all the practical applications Everything that Paul's been telling us here, God through Paul's been telling us here, walking in the newness of life, being kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. D different commands, you know, therefore followers of God as dear children. Everything we've been learning, he says, put it into action. Hit the eye. It's exactly what God wants from us. He wants us to put all the knowledge and practical applications we've read to this point. He wants us to get the eye of tiger. But to get the eye of the tiger, as a believer, born again believer, someone who's placed their faith in the finished work of the cross, you need to know where your strength comes from. And right away, we read in verse 10, we find out where our strength comes from. Because all the things that we're told, it's all great. And, you know, it's all great when you read these things. It sounds great, right? But just the other day in Sunday school, someone brings up a, an issue in life. And then we have a discussion. How do, we, how do we put what we're learning here and take it outside of these walls? It's great to have it in our minds, but what about you in your heart? And then using it. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to be that light, the channel of blessing. He wants that for you and I. He wants marriage couple, married couples to be actually married couples walking as, as one. He wants children to obey their parents. We've talked about it. But it all starts... With the Lord. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit. But we have to understand where we get the strength from. Because when things come up in life, the stresses of life, life gets tough, doesn't it? And you have to turn to who? The Lord. Looking for His leading. When things are great, we tend not to look to the Lord. Because everything's easy peasy, right? Right? But when things are tough, we look to Him. We know that His grace is sufficient for, the, for us. 
And so, but first and foremost here, in order to understand or to get that eye of the tiger, you have to understand your strength. Know where your strength comes from. We know understand it comes from the Lord. Read verse 10. It says, again, it says, put, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and where? In the power of whose? His might. And the question you could ask is why? Because I love asking the question, right? Why? Because every kid asks the question, what? Why? You ever teach a Sunday school class or anything like that? Kids will ask what? Why? You better have an answer. <laughs> the world's tough. That's why. <laughs> and times are harsh. They're, you know, things come up. And first and foremost, your human strength won't work. It just won't work in this spirit. We've, we are fighting a spiritual battle. And you have to fight spiritual with spiritual. Our only hope of strength in this spiritual warfare is to be strengthened by the Lord. I want you to turn to a verse of scripture here in 1 Corinthians. Hold your place in Ephesians. But go to the book of, of Corinthians chapter 16. We're to know our strength. Our strength is in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, chapter 16, verse 13. Let's read it together. He says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, and what? Be strong. Your human, your human strength won't work. We're to be strong in who? The Lord. Quit being, trying to trust in yourself. He wants us to be trusting in Him through the cross and resurrection of Christ. Victory is already won. The devil has lost. The only power he has is the power that you give him. So we're to stand firm in Christ's victory. It says, finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. We're to stand firm in Christ's victory. Paul desired in Philippians 3.10, he wanted to know Him in the power of what? His sufferings, His resurrection. He wants us to understand the, 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 we have the resurrection power in us. He wants us... Go to Ephesians 3, verse 20. He wants us to understand that we can go to him, Ephesians 3.20. We can go to him anytime. We can trust him. He is faithful. And we can count on him. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that what? Worketh in us. The power that worketh in us, sometimes we want to, ah, God, this is too much for you. Now, he's saying that he can do any, anything unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that what we ask or think. God is able to do it. He is able, and we can trust Him. He is faithful, and we're not to be trusting in our own selves. Because if we can just trust in our own selves, there was no need for, the Lord, for Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Without Him, we're bankrupt. Without Him in this spiritual warfare, it's going to get tough. You start trusting in your own self. But He says, your victory is in the Lord. You have victory through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, Satan doesn't want you to understand that. He doesn't want you to understand 
That you have victory. That in Colossians 3.10 says that you are what? Complete in who? Christ. That nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. He doesn't want you understanding that. He doesn't want you to understand that you have eternal security. He doesn't want you to understand what God's grace and love is and how you possess it if you're a child of God and how you can show grace and love to the lost. He doesn't want you to understand that at all. God does. And so he says, I want you to trust me. I want you to stand strong in me. Because you have the resurrection power in you. And God can do all things. He can do all things. And he can do more than what we can ask or think. I mean, put that in your mind and think about that one time. Read Ephesians 3.20 and just really sit there and say, wow, you can trust the Lord. We're to stand firm in Christ's victory because we have the victory. We have that eternal hope. And see, the eye of the tiger is, is knowing your strength and giving your all. It's trusting in that. It's trusting Ephesians 3.20. Knowing that God is in control. Knowing that he, when God is for you, who can be what? Against you. It's knowing Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good. Does he not? To them who love God. According to his purpose. He works it all together for good. Do you believe that? Amen. Then live it. And be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's exactly what God wants from us in our Christian walk. We, have, we need to be strong in the Lord, who is our strength in our everyday battles. Having the eye of a tiger is also not going in blind to a fight. Okay, God wants us to know our opponent. And just like anything, in, in reality of life, here's a football player, right? And football players, they study what? Tapes or DVDs or now iPads now, right? They study these things. They want to know their opponent. They want to call out plays before the quarterback is switching the play. They want to know it. It's no difference in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. We should know the enemy. Why? Because the enemy knows you. He knows you. And he's trying to attack you. It's a spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rose of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's real. Now, verse 11 and 12, he says right away, put on the whole armor of God. We're going to get to that armor. We're going to get to that in Ephesians 6. We're going to get to it. And we're going to get the reason why we need to put it on. But our opponent, first and foremost, is the devil. He's Lucifer. He's the enemy. And he wants nothing else but to keep what? The lost blinded. He wants nothing else to think that you're nothing. He wants nothing else to create havoc for your life. But how's, how's he creating havoc for your life? Did you ever ask yourself that? How's he creating havoc? We're to put the whole armor of God on to stand against what? wiles of the devil the wiles of the devil it says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and the wiles there is 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 deceit deceiving deceitful crafter is trickery he likes to trick you and i satan likes to trick us he can't why would he why is it only tricking because who are you in Christ? You're in Christ. Who are you in Christ? A child of God. Who can separate you from the love of Christ? What? Answer it. Nothing. Who is above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and everything in his name? Who is it? Lord Jesus Christ. And who are you in? The Lord Jesus Christ. You're in the beloved. Satan can't touch you. He, all he can do is trick you. Try to mess you up mentally. Think that you're not good enough. 
He creates havoc. He throws trickery. He tricks us with bad doctrine. Bad doctrine. And by taking you captive in your strongholds. We're going to look at those two things. By, with bad doctrine, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He's going to trick us with bad doctrine. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. We'll read it together. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is what? transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to whose works? Their works. How Satan working today? He's creating bad doctrine, false doctrine. Individuals that are not preaching God's grace, that salvation is totally free. There's nothing that you and I can do about it. They want to add stuff to it. That's only one aspect of it. But it's bad doctrines. And you see what they're doing. They're doing it according to their works. When you get someone up here and telling you what to do, and they never open the Bible, what should you do? Walk out. The Bible is, is priority. This is the truth. And so he, met, he tricks you with bad doctrine. Tricks you with bad doctrine, thinking that you, know, you don't have eternal security. That you're not once saved, always saved. I've heard that a time with you. You're saved upon when? Upon salvation. The Holy Spirit sealed you upon the day of redemption. And nothing can separate you from God's love. From the love of Christ. The second thing he does to you, he likes to trick you and I, is he likes to, he takes you captive in your strongholds, right? Now what's a stronghold? Go to 2 Corinthians 10 real quick. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. But strongholds are, are these. And things that, he, he puts these things in your mind. And, and, you, and you hear this time and time again. This is a, a brain, obviously, and strongholds. God cannot fix this. How many times have you heard that? Right? There's, there's all ones up there. No one will ever what? Love me. I deserve to be punished. I have to look at for what? Number one. These are strongholds that he can take a hold of and make you really believe them and, and just say, this is who you are. You can't get out of it. But look what God says in 2 Corinthians 10. Addiction, drug addiction, every, you know, those things are strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of what? Of Christ. Satan takes the strongholds of our life wherever our flesh sometimes takes us and we get obsessed with the world. That's why he always says, be what? Don't be, trans you know, don't be transformed to this world. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's word. Don't be conformed to this world. Because Satan, he takes the world. It's his, it's his masterpiece of art, by the way. He takes those things. If you're going to conform yourself to this world, he... He's just like, he keeps feeding you. He just keeps feeding you the world. You want the world, you can just have, he just keeps feeding you the world. The things that we get involved with, it does matter. Because Satan can make you think that you can't get out of it. But what does God say? You can get out of it. You can get out of it by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can get out of it because he says, be strong in the Lord and what? The power of whose might? His might. 
You can get out of it when you understand your identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that Satan has nothing over you. But he throws, he tricks us, he makes you think that you can't get out of it. He, he gets you so bummed out, so stressed and so depressed that you're stuck there. And that there's no way out. God says there's a way out. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he likes to trick us. He likes to he creates bad doctrine. He tries to take us captive in strongholds. And second, he likes to make you believe that the battle is against each other. Go back to Ephesians 6. He, he, he wants you, to, he wants you to, to believe that we f- are supposed to fight against flesh and flesh, man. Second, Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, for we wrestle what? What's that word? Not against flesh and blood. We fight a spiritual warfare. But he wants you to believe that you fight against each other. He wants you to believe those things. But Ephesians 4, as we've already talked about, it says we're to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace in Ephesians 4. The peace is already there. We're to be endeavoring, striving for it, working on our relationships as members of the body of Christ. We are workers together. We're not to be enemies together. We fight a spiritual warfare. We're in this together as members of the body, as children of God. We're to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. The unity is here. But Satan wants you to believe that the unity is not there and that you and I are enemies and we should not forgive each other and we should keep judging each other. He's doing it. That we should gossip about each other. The world is about that. They have a TV show called what? The Gossip Girl. I've never watched it. You're welcome. And if I did, you can kick me out. But you can just read the title. You see what the world does. The world judges. The world hates. Things are going on over in Ukraine. There's hate. There's murder. We don't fight a spiritual warfare. We don't. Yeah, we fight a spiritual warfare. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We're to keep the unity of the spirit. The other thing he wants us to do is he got if he if he gets us into our mindsets. He, if we think that we can't get out of the strongholds of our life and we can't get out of those things, that, and if he can trick us from with bad doctrine. He can, reality, make us lose our focus. We can forget about the lost. We are ambassadors for Christ. The message of reconciliation. You forget that as a member of the body. You miss the purpose of our life here right now. God wants all man to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And if we allow Satan, because we have to allow him, the fight's on. But if we allow him to, to dupe us, to get us off track, we, we forget about the lost. We forget about the person next to us, our next door neighbors. We forget about our purpose here. 2 Corinthians 4 verse chapter 4 verse 3 and 7. Second Corinthians 4 verse 3 to 7. It 
Satan and his fallen angels, they're going to hell. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. And he wants to take every single person with him. Don't lose sight of this spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 7 says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. In whom the God of this world, Satan, Lucifer, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He's blinded the lost. He's blinded them. Unless the light of the glory of the gospel. So if we get, if he dupes us, if we get into our own misery and shame, and I get it. Life is difficult. But that's why he starts this chapter out, this verse out in 10. Be strong in who? The Lord and the power of his might. That you have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have a purpose. You're a part of his workmanship. And we're to get the gospel out because Satan has blinded the minds unless the glorious gospel, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We just read about what Satan's doing. He transforms himself in what? In the image of light. He preaches himself. What are we to do? We're not to preach ourselves. We're to preach the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, what he's done for us on that cross. Verse 6 says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we're to let the light shine. Don't forget that we're in a spiritual warfare and Satan's going to do everything possible to distract us, to get beat us up, to kick us on the ground, to make us forget who we are in Christ so we can't share the glorious gospel because he wants to take everybody else to hell. That's what he wants. He's heading there. Back to Ephesians 6. He says, the eye of the tiger is knowing your strength and giving your all. It's putting on the whole armor of God. It's exactly what God wants from us. We need to be strong in the Lord, who is our strength in our everyday battles. The eye of the tiger is also not going into it blind. We need to know our enemy, understand his agenda. God wants us to know our opponent. We fight a spiritual warfare. If we do these two things, if we do these two things, it doesn't matter how often we get punched in the face or get kicked down. We will be standing firm if we have the whole armor of God on. So we're to get the eye of the tiger, and that is standing firm in God's strength, in his power. And so I invite you all, we should invite each other to stand firm together as members of the body of Christ. So we're to stand firm, it says. Verse 13, he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand. In this evil day, and let me tell you, when your number comes up, and you're under a, a satanic attack, you must be wearing the whole armor of God. You must do it. Now, to break this down here in verses 14 to 18, we can break this in two categories here, the whole armor of God. Ready? We can break it down in two categories, three each. The first three you have with you all the time upon salvation. Okay? The last three we're told to take and use them as needed. So let's look at the first three. Verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We are to stand with truth like a belt around your waist. Truth is, is the objective standard by which reality is measured. God's word is what? Truth. God's word says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Truth, thy word, is truth. 
God's word is truth. He wants us to use his word in our daily life. Trusting him. Faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. We walk by faith and what? Not by sight. God's word is truth. Also, we need righteousness like armor on your chest. Verse 14 says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness was received when you accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When you placed your faith in what Christ did for you on the cross, God imputed Christ's perfect righteousness to us. Second Corinthians 5.